the story runs vastly. Nicholas Nickleby, devoid of prospects at the death of his penniless father, must get himself a situation and make his fortune, all the better to support his helpless mother and sister. It is his uncle, Ralph Nickleby, who suggests he enter into the Yorkshire school system. Decisions are made, deals are squared, and Nicholas launches on an encounter with that exalted sinister, Mr. Wackford Squeers, headmaster of the infamous Dubber Boys Hall. <laughs> predicted, all is not well at the Yorkshire School. It fast reveals itself as a den of indescribable sin and treachery, a snake pit writhing with squalor and degradation and the most unforgivable cruelties in comprehension. How can a spare lad of nineteen hope to surmount such unimaginable tyrannies in a bid for integrity and righteousness? Will wretched Spike be rescued? Will Squeers get his comeuppance? Will terrible northern stereotypes be perpetuated? You are about to find out. Players in orchestra! Players in! Education at Mr. Wackford Squeers' Academy, Duffer Boys Hall, at the delightful village of Duffer Boys near Greta Bridge in Yorkshire. Youth are boarded, clothed, booked, furnished with pocket money, provided with all necessaries, instructed in all languages, living and dead, mathematics, orthography, geometry, astronomy, trigonometry, the use of the globes, algebra, single stick, if required, writing, arithmetic, fortification, and every other branch of classical literature. No extras, no vacations. And diet unparalleled. Mr. Squeers is in town and attends daily from one till four at the Saracen's Head, Snow Hill, London. Unable assistant wanted. Nicholas Nickleby, in the nineteenth year of his age, arrived at eight o'clock of a November morning on the faith of an advertisement in the London papers to join Mr. Squeers, the cheap, the terribly cheap, the Yorkshire schoolmaster. Mr. Squeers was standing by one of the coffee-room fireplaces, and his appearance was not prepossessing. He had but one eye, and the popular prejudice runs in favour of two. The blank side of his face was much puckered up, which gave him a sinister appearance, especially when he smiled. <laughs> he appeared ill at ease in his clothes, as if he were in a perpetual state of astonishment at finding himself so respectable. The learned gentleman had before himself a breakfast of coffee, hot toast, and cold round of beef. But he was at that moment intent on preparing another breakfast for five little boys. It is two penny worth of milk, is it, waiter? said Mr. Squeers, looking down into a large mug. That's two penny worth, sir. What a rare article of milk is to be sure in London. Just fill that mug up with lukewarm water, Willem, will you? To the worry top, sir? Why, the milk will be drowned Ah! Serve it right for being so dear. Coming directly, sir. 
Mr. Squeers took a large bite out of a hot toast and recognised Nicholas. Oh, sit down, Mr. Nickleby. Here we are, breakfasting, you see. Nicholas did not see that anybody was breakfasting except Mr. Squeers. Ah, oh, that's the milk and water, is it, Willem? His richness. Think of the many beggars and orphans in the streets who would be glad of this, little boys. Now, when I say number one, the boy on the left hand here is the window, they take a drink. And when I say number two, the boy next him. And so on till we come to number five. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Keep ready till I tell you to begin. Subdue so your appetites, my dears, and you've conquered human nature. This is the way we inculcate strength of mind, Mr. Nickleby. Nicholas murmured something in reply, and the little boys remained in torments of expectation. Thank God for a good breakfast. Number one may take a drink. Number one seized the mug ravenously, and had just drunk enough to make him wish for more, when Mr. Squeers gave the signal for number two, who gave up at the same interesting moment to number three. And the process was repeated until the milk and water terminated with number five. In a very short time, the bell was heard. No, oh, oh, no, oh, I thought it wouldn't be long. Give what you have the time to eat to me, boys. You want it on the road. They certainly did want it on the road, and very much too, for the journey was long, the weather was intensely cold, a great deal of snow fell from time to time, and the wind was intolerably keen. Mr. Squeers got down at almost every stage to uh, stretch his legs, he said, and always came back with a very red nose and composed himself to sleep directly. It was a long journey, but the longest lane has a turning at last, and late in the night the coach took them past a lonely roadside inn. I, uh, I, uh, called, Nicholby? Rather, sir, I must say. Is it much farther to Duffer Boys Hall? About three miles from here. But you needn't call it a hall down here. Nicholas coughed. <clears throat> as if he would like to know why. The fact is, it ain't a hall, no. We call it a hall up in London because it sounds better. But I don't know it by that name in these parts. No, a, a, a man may call his house an island if he likes. There's no act of parliament against that, I believe. Squeers eyed him at the conclusion of this little dialogue, and finding that he had grown thoughtful, contented himself with lashing the pony until they reached a journey's end, when he ushered him into a small parlour, scantily furnished, where they had not been a couple of minutes, when a female bounced into the room, and, seizing Mr. Squeers by the throat, gave him two loud kisses, one close after the other, like a postman's knock. <coughs> this lady was of a large, raw-boned figure, about half a head taller than Mr. Squeers, and was dressed in a dimity night jacket. How is my squeery deary? Quite well, my love. The boys are all as they were, I suppose. Oh, yes, the boys is well enough. Only that young pitcher's had a fever. No. Damn that chap! He's always at something of that sort. 